In the previous videos in this series, I've illustrated beams like this, with the main direction potentially pointing towards a receiver, but also a width. And this is representing that the signal is not only strong at the receiver, but also in a larger angular range. And in this video, we will characterize that range, which is called the beam width, and how it depends on how many transmit antennas we are using. This experimental setup is now configured to send the beam from the transmitter to the receiver. So all the transmit antennas send the same signal with the same phase so that we form a beam towards the receiver, which we could illustrate like this. But the exact shape of this beam is something that we can't measure like this. We are only seeing how much received signal power we get in the direction where the beam is supposed to point. So in order to figure out what is the signal power that is sent in different directions, we need to rotate the transmitter. So this is what I'm going to do. I will rotate it and see what is received power when we have different rotations. So if we start, we are minus 15.8 dBm. I rotate by 5 degrees. Almost nothing. 10 degrees, we see a small loss. 15, further loss in signal power, 20 degrees. We lose more, 25, it keeps going down, 30, now it's really low, 35, start going up again, 40, going up a little bit, 45, goes up again, 50, well, there seems to be a pattern that doesn't exactly look like this beam, but it actually goes down and goes up again. So in order to understand this better, I will measure the received signal power when I've rotated this one for a large range of different angles with five degree difference. And I will also do this by considering both having all four channels being used, but also only using the two columns in the middle or only one of the columns, because this is changing the shape of the beam. I've actually illustrated this in the previous video, but now we will look at the exact shape. I'm done, so let's have a look at the result. Here is the radiation pattern that I measured with one transmit antenna, so one of the columns in this array. And what you can see is that the distance from the origin here is the strength of the signal. So it's minus 40 dBm, minus 30 on this circle, minus 20 and minus 10. And then we can see different angles. So from the top here, we have the strength that I measured when we are right in front of the array. When we move to the left towards 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and finally towards 90 degrees, well, that is describing the angle to the left as seen from the transmitter. And same thing from the array to the right, minus 30, minus 60, minus 90 degree. And this is then the curve that contains the received signal power that I was measuring. And I have one measurement for every five degrees. The curve isn't entirely smooth because we are drawing straight lines in between those measurements. But we can see that the largest number, so the furthest from the origin, is when we are transmitting forward from the transmitter. When we move to the side, first, nothing is really happening. We have roughly the same value, so we are moving on a circular curve here. But then after a while, we start to lose in received signal power. An ideal omnidirectional antenna that is spreading its power equally in all angular direction will give us a circular curve like this. And we only get that between minus 40 and plus 40 degrees. So this is where most of the power is coming. And then to the sides, there is much less. And that is also what we noticed when we we're starting to beam form to the minus 45 or plus 45 angles. If I am now turning on the second antenna, so we have two antennas here in the middle that are together beam forming right forward. We get the red curve instead of the blue one. And what we can observe is that there is a beam forming gain and power gain because we use more power. So we have a stronger signal forward. 
And we also get a different shape of this curve. It's not as circular anymore. There is a smaller region here in front of it where the signal power is going. And then it goes more rapidly down to the sides, which is showing the shape of that we are focusing the signal forward from the array and there is less transmitted to the sides. Both antennas are transmitting signals that have the blue shape, but when they are interacting over there, we are getting the red shape due to constructive and destructive interference behaviors. If I am now turning on the last two antennas, we get this black curve, which is with four antennas. And we see once again that we get an even more directive signal upwards here, and then to the sides, it's falling off even more quickly. And there are some new interesting behaviors happening here to the sides. So let's have a closer look at this kind of radiation pattern, which is also known as a beamforming pattern. So here in the center, we call this transmission the main lobe or main beam. And this is the shape of a beam that I have illustrated many times before in this video series. What we can see on the side here is something known as side lobes. So when we are focusing the signals more and more, in this case it appears when we are using four antennas, in addition to getting a strong focusing in the desired direction that is falling off rather rapidly here when we go to outer angles, we also get these side lobes that are pointing in undesired directions. And these are like extra beams that are much weaker than the main beam, but they're still pointing in a particular direction and creating some additional strength of the signals there. But if we are comparing the side lobes with the main lobe, we can still see that the main lobe is something like 13 dB stronger, which means 20 times stronger. So we really have a strong main lobe compared to these side lobes. And often when we are illustrating beams, we're using dB scales, which actually make them look less directive than they actually are when we would measure things in linear scale. We notice that the transmission becomes more and more directive the more antennas we are using. And this is something that we can also measure, often in terms of what we call the beam width. And one metric is the half power beam width, which is the width of the angular interval here where the received signal power is equal to the one that you have at the maximum direction or at least up to 50% or half of that. In this case, the half power beam width is roughly 20 degrees. So 10 degrees on one side are the main direction and 10 degrees on the other side. We can compare this practical result that we have measured with theory. So the left hand side here is what I measured and the right hand side is something that I've been generating using formulas. And in this case, we can have infinite many points when we are drawing the curve. So that is why they're looking more smooth. But apart from that, you have the same kind of behaviors. There is a certain shape here with one antenna. You get more directivity with two antennas. And with four antennas, you get even more directivity and some side lobes. To generate the graph here on the right hand side, I use the following gain function that you can find in textbooks. It is a function of the azimuth angle theta. It is a function of the azimuth angle. The red part is the antenna pattern. So that is describing how one antenna is behaving. The blue part is the beam forming pattern when we are using M antennas that are half a wavelength spaced apart in a uniform linear array. So it contains the sine square, it contains pi, and once again, the azimuth angle and the number of antennas at multiple places here. It is this expression that is transforming the blue curve from one antenna to two antennas and four antennas, depending on the value of M, one, two, or four. And it is the oscillation of the sine functions here that are giving us the side lobes part of the time. So the measured radiation pattern is actually matching very nicely with the theoretical curves. The only difference is that we were actually using real antennas instead of some hypothetical antenna with a cosine radiation pattern. In summary, when we send a signal from only one column in this array, it doesn't have any clear directivity, at least not horizontally. So the signal is spanning over most of the angles. When we use two columns, we get a more narrow transmission over a particular range of angles. And that also means that there is more signal power in those directions. And further, when we use all four columns, we get a nice beam pointing towards the receiver, but still it is spanning 10th 
of degrees. And we also get some additional side lobes in particular directions where we also get a stronger signal. But the main strength of the signal is in the main lobe, just as we are intending to. But it is important to notice that beam forming doesn't create something laser pointer like. It is creating a beam with a particular beam width, which we shouldn't forget about. And it is shrinking as we add more elements. So if we make the array large compared to the wavelength, we can get a very narrow beam, but not in a setup like this. Before I end this video series, I would like to follow up on a request that I received on social media, namely to show that one can use a setup like this for sensing purposes, which means that we are not interested in sending a strong signal from transmitter or the receiver, but to figure out if an object exists on a particular location or not. So here is the target location that I've selected. And right now there's no object there. What object are we talking about? Well, here's a glass that is wrapped in aluminium foil, so it will reflect the signals. So if I put it there, and you look at the received signal power, we actually see that there is a small loss in power here. Uh, so it is actually already affecting the propagation environment a lot. But if you would like to know even more if the object is there or not, we can start to play around with the beam forming. So I place this one in a 30 degree angle here. So let me change the beam forming to point in that direction. And we see that right now I have a lower received signal power, minus 27 dBm. But if I remove the object, the received signal power is dropping much, much further to minus 35 or so. So depending on if the object is there or not, I have many dB of variations in the signal strength. And this kind of phenomenon can be used together with the beamforming system like this in order to beamform to target locations and figuring out if objects exist or not. And this is to some extent the main principle of radar sensing. So thank you everyone for watching this video series and thank you for all the suggestions of experiments to carrying out. I hope to see you on the channel again.